Welcome to another edition of Northwestern Outdoors Radio, the award-winning show covering fishing, hunting, conservation, destinations, and other outdoors recreation across the greater Northwest. Northwestern Outdoors is brought to you by Max Lur, Sportsman's Warehouse, Cena C Seafood, and Wallawa County Chamber of Commerce in the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. And now, let's see what's happening this week with your host, John Cruz. Welcome aboard. Did you hear about the unicorn elk photographed on a trail cam near Yakima a couple of weeks ago? From iFiber One News, we learned the spike bull elk has a regular antler on the left side of its head, but instead of an antler on the right side, that antler has grown out right in the middle of the animal's forehead. Kyle Garrison with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife says this kind of antler growth is uncommon, but it is a natural occurring phenomenon and doesn't appear to be causing the animal any harm. I will say this, though. If a hunter harvests this bull elk, I would love to see the look on the taxidermist's face when they bring that head in to get mounted. This week on Northwestern Outdoors Radio, we've got a great lineup of guests for you. We're going to start off in just a couple of minutes talking to Christopher Hurst. He is the author of a brand new book, Shooting Liberally, that is a great guide for first-time gun owners and it has a lot of great stories in it too because Chris was actually a Washington state representative for several years and he's also a retired law enforcement officer who has a very interesting career behind him and a lot of that information is brought to bear in this book you're going to enjoy this conversation We'll also be talking to Bob Loomis again with Max Luer. The topic this time, that would be those salmon that are down there at Hanford Reach right now. Those big kings, they're starting to turn color, but they are still there to be caught. And Bob will tell you how to catch them near the Vernita Bridge right now. After that, we're going to talk to Meg Carney. She is the author of a new book called The Outdoor Minimalist. What is outdoor minimalism? Well, it's kind of a new movement. It includes ethics like leave no trace and pack it in, pack it out. But it goes a lot further than that. And Meg is going to tell you more about it. It being October, deer hunting seasons are opening up across the Northwest. As a matter of fact, they're opening up in Oregon this weekend, and they're coming up real soon in our other states. And with that in mind, Jason Brooks, the very well-known, prolific outdoors writer and big game hunter, is going to share some advice on things you should do before the season starts to get ready that will help you have more success in the field. As always, we've got our Sportsman's Warehouse Trivia Question of the Week for you. Your chance to win a $25 gift card from America's premier outfitter. And oh yes, we've got our other guest that's with us every week. That would be David Sparks, the host of Sportsman Spotlight, brought to you every week by the Ag Information Network of the West. Don't forget the tenderloins. David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight, a recent post from Fish and Game. Regardless of their excitement or exhaustion, one item on the post-harvest checklist that hunters should never forget to check off is to remove the tenderloins when field dressing the animal that they have harvested. While a forgotten pair of binoculars might mean one more trip up the mountain, a forgotten pair of tenderloins could cost you a trip to the courthouse. Fish and Game official Roger Phillips. Those are a tasty part of the animal, and I didn't honestly realize that if you forget those, then you're technically, well, not technically, you are wasting a portion of the game, which is illegal. And so our enforcement folks put that out. That's probably something that they encounter. We don't want anybody to, A, leave perfectly tasty meat on the hill and also face the possibility of a ticket. So that's just kind of a general reminder that you're kind of in the heat of the battle there. It's sometimes easy to forget those. So remember to go inside and get those out of there and not only do you not have to worry about getting a ticket you're going to get a really tasty meal out of the deal because that's some (laughs) of the finest meat on an animal yeah that's funny what is the rationale behind writing a ticket to somebody is it called wasting meat yeah it is we're not trying to get anybody on this it's just kind of a reminder when you're butchering that animal in the field to remember that those are in there and you do need to remove those too i certainly always recognize it's a shame to waste good food, but now I find it's a ticket. David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. From a bull elk ripping a bugle across the valley to wing beats on a duck marsh, public lands and waters are integral to our outdoor heritage. Become a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and stand up for our public lands and waters. Visit backcountryhunters.org today. You've probably been told that to reach a millennial farmer, you have to go digital. Hmm. 
Facebook, Vimeo, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, an online publication, or maybe a podcast. Hmm, but which one? Oh, and how receptive is this age group to your sales pitch during non-work social time? Maybe the best place to reach a farmer with a farming solution message is when they are, well, quite frankly, farming. You know, it's easy for us to find them during the day as most farmers are behind the wheel of a pickup truck or farm equipment with the radio on listening to this station for the Ag Information Network of the West News. If you'd like to deliver information about your terrific product or service, give us a call and we'll connect you directly with our community of loyal farmer listeners. Reach real farmers right here, right now, as they listen to what is important to their farm operation. They trust us. They'll trust you. Enjoy a meal of wild Alaskan seafood delivered right to your door. Sina Sea offers premium quality wild Alaskan fish and shellfish to include Copper River King and Silver Salmon, Halibut, Black Hot, King Crab, and of course, Copper River Sockeye Salmon. Order it blast frozen or smoked and experience a slice of Alaska for a special meal you won't forget. Buy your seafood now at SinaSea.com. That's S-E-N-A-S-E-A, SinaSea.com. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got Christopher Hurst on the line. He is the author of a new book, Shooting Liberally, a gun guide for Democrats and independents in a time of political division. He has a very interesting background. Number one, longtime law enforcement officer and commander the Black Diamond Police Department, had a really interesting career. He's also a former Democratic member of the Washington State House of Representatives. Chris, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about your book and why you wrote it? Well, it's interesting. I uh, spent all those years in law enforcement and, of course, was a member of the House of Representatives as a Democrat. And in the last couple of years, probably starting almost three years ago, it seems like every Democrat or more liberal-leaning person I know has come to me with a very strange question. And it's, Chris, I, I want to get a gun. What kind of a gun should I get? It kind of floored me a little bit because these weren't hunters. You know, there's a lot of people that hunt and, and you know, sporting folks out there. And political persuasion doesn't really have a lot to do with that. But as first time time gun owners, all these folks are saying, I think I need to get a gun to protect myself. You know, we're in unsettling times. And the first thing I say is, look, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> if you're going to get a gun, you got to learn a little more about it. You just don't go buy a gun. And as I keep getting these inquiries, a lot of them said you should write a book. And so I thought about it. I spent uh, over 25 years in law enforcement. I grew up as a hunter, so I'm kind of familiar with all those aspects. In my police career, I worked narcotics for 14 years, and I served over 1,400 search warrants. So I'm familiar with pretty much every shooting or tactical situation you can imagine with having served that many warrants and use of firearms. So I wrote a book. It's neither pro-gun or anti-gun. It's just basically saying if you want to own a gun, you really got to learn some things. You got to be a responsible gun owner. And if you are, then it might be a good decision. If you can't commit to being a responsible gun owner, please don't get one. Get a baseball bat or some pepper spray or something else. But if you're going to go ahead and get a gun, here are some guidelines to get and use one. And then secondarily, don't assume that a gun is a good weapon for self-defense or even home defense unless you understand some of the fundamentals of tactical situations and what it's going to feel like the first time somebody points a gun at you. Well, I really have been enjoying this book. It really is very well written for the first time gun owner. And there are a lot of those, like you said, out there, especially during this time of COVID and political unrest and social unrest. A lot of people, like you said, are looking to buy their first firearm. And this is definitely a good book for it. Now, this is primarily a fishing, hunting, outdoor show, and you grew up as a hunter, and you do touch on some subjects that I think are of interest to hunters. You know, this is a time of year when a lot of folks are heading to the range and sighting in their rifles or muzzle loaders or any other firearm they plan on using. And you talk about range safety in one of your chapters. What are some of the takeaways that folks ought to know about this? It really does impact hunters, and here's why. So I was a hunter and learned safe firearm handling techniques a very long time ago. And you, as all hunters know, or lifetime hunters, there are things that you just simply don't do. 
And those come from either maybe somebody in your family taught you or you learned from others. But think about all the folks that, you know, go deer hunting or elk hunting. In my lifetime, I actually got drawn for three mountain goat permits, which is odd because I'm pretty old and I had a chance to get those permits when you could get them every two years. So think about all of what went into being a responsible hunter and, and a safe firearms owner. The problem we have today is you don't have that social group around you. So what people have a tendency to do is to buy a gun. They want to either go to a range or more frequently simply go out into the woods. And we as responsible gun owners don't need the damage that's being done to our reputation and the shutting down of forest lands because people use guns improperly. So I'm going to really encourage folks as they're out in the woods or running into folks, if you see someone, number one, and it's in the book, unsafely handling firearms, walk up and have a chat with them. Talk about why you can't shoot into trees, why you can't shoot exploding targets, why you can't shoot, you know, things that blow up. And what we find is there's been such a proliferation of not guns, but irresponsible gun owners that immediately default to public lands or even private lands that is giving all of us a bad name. So if you go to forest lands that were great hunting areas that are owned by large timber companies or other areas that for, you know, generations were open to hunting of all types, waterfowl, you know, big game, they're being closed and access is being restricted because of irresponsible gun ownership. So really hunters have a big piece in this. And and we also have a little bit of a responsibility to intervene with folks and talk with them when we see things being done unsafely. So the book goes into, if you're going to be a gun owner, you're probably going to think seriously about shooting on public lands. There are some very important things you need to understand as you go onto public lands. Everything from how it interferes with other users' use of those lands, be them public or private, and then just straight up safety issues that are very concerning. There are some fundamental rules that have been around a long time. Every hunter knows them. But as we see this explosion of, once again, another large group of uneducated gun owners that are not taking classes. And I really encourage people to take classes if you're going to get a gun. But learn some of these basics about having a firearm on public or private lands because it really is harming, you know, legitimate and well-educated users of the forest by having them shut down because people are having a tendency to default to, well, I'm just going to shoot it in the woods. Right. And as a matter of fact, you helped form a group that addressed this very situation near where you live. we got about two minutes left. Tell our listeners about this situation. Yeah, we formed a group up in my community, which is Greenwater, the White River Forest Protection Association. And we keep signs up for the Forest Service in our area, but we also contact people. We walk up to them and talk to them about what's safe, what's not safe, direct them to safe places to shoot. And we've been pretty effective. We have reduced illegal and unsafe shooting by about 85% in the last six years in our area. But we also urge safe gun owners and hunters to do the same thing. So outreach is part of it. I think that there's a lot of guidelines in this book that would be good even for a hunter to read and understand the types of people that are getting guns today and participate in this process of how do we change the culture where we can reduce the unsafe and illegal shooting on public and private lands that's harming all of us. Very well said. So here's a question I get a lot, Chris, when it comes to buying that firearm, especially for home defense. You know, there's pistols, there's rifles, there's shotguns. What do you recommend? You know, the interesting thing is the gun that's being purchased most frequently today are, you know, AR-15 style weapons, of which there's many varieties, and it is not really a very good weapon for home defense. (laughs) So in the book, we talk about a far superior weapon that's been around forever, and it's a shotgun. We explain in the book exactly why a shotgun is a better weapon to defend your home, and I've been in enough shooting situations and tactical encounters to give some real-life stories. And interestingly enough, even a hunting rifle is a great home defense weapon if you think it through. Generally speaking, people buy weapons that fire fast, have a lot of bullets, and of course a bullet doesn't care what gun it's been shot from you know, when it hits someone. So we talk about what's the realities of the accuracy and the reliability of weapons to defend your home. And curiously, the guns people buying today are not really the ones that are a very good choice. And the book explains a lot of tactical and shooting situations that prove to you why that's true. Again, folks, the book is Shooting Liberally. It's by Christopher Hurst. You can get it at Amazon or online at the Barnes & Noble website, too. Definitely a good read, especially if you're looking at buying your first firearm. Or for that matter, even if you already are a firearms owner, it's well-written, a lot of good stories. Definitely worth a read. Shooting Liberally by Christopher Hurst. Chris, thanks so much for sharing this with us today on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thanks for having me.
This portion of the show was brought to you by our friends at Cena Sea Seafood. And you know, it's not just salmon that they catch out of the cold waters of Alaska and deliver to your door. No, they catch all sorts of other fish too, including some very delicious fish with white meat. We're talking about lingcod, very mild tasting fillets. We're talking true cod, which I personally enjoy quite a bit. And we are talking halibut, not just halibut fillets, which are delicious in and of themselves, but also halibut chop and those sweet tasting halibut cheeks. You'll find them all at SinaSea.com. That's S-E-N-A-S-E-A.com. Head to the website, pick out your dinner, order it today, have it delivered to your door, and enjoy a fantastic meal of wild-caught Alaskan seafood. The website again, SinaSea.com, and don't forget to use the promo code OUTDOORSRADIO for 10% off your order. Come to Oregon's Wallowa County for outdoors adventure. Hike, ride, paddle, fish, or sightsee to your heart's content. And then visit one of our wonderful towns, whether it be Joseph with its beautiful bronze statues, our county seat in Enterprise, or one of our charming small towns like Wallowa, Imnaha, or Troy, where you can eat, shop, and sleep before continuing your adventure the next day. Plan your visit now at WallowaCountyChamber.com. That's WallowaCountyChamber.com. with more of the great outdoors on Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. It's that time again. It's time for another extended Max Minute brought to you every week by Max Lure. With us again, Bobby Loomis. Always great to have you on the show, sir. Thanks, John. So a lot of folks are heading to the mid-Columbia, Hanford Reach, Vernita, because there's a lot of big kings to be caught there this time of year. How would you recommend rigging up for that fishery? Well, you know, John, one of the uh, number one things that's being used up there right now are the 360 rotational flashers, like the scent flash. The unfortunate thing is for everybody else, they don't have a scent chamber like we do with the scent flash. Right. So, you know, they're high UV bodied. They have a removable fin, so you can get a little bit different type of movement on it if you want. But bottom line is it works like the same 360 degree, but you can add scent to it. Along with that 360-degree flasher, the scent flash, the wedding ring salmon tech spinner was something that we designed where these guys are now running just a straight spinner. No bait, no nothing. So you can run scent in the scent flash, but then run the salmon tech spinner down there. You're drawing fish to it, and the spinners work fantastic right now. Because you're not using bait and you're relying on the scent flash to disperse the scent for you, are you running a shorter leader? No, you're still running, uh, you know, roughly a 38 to 42 inch type leader. You want to get movement on the gear. So doing that when you've got that three foot, you know, rotational movement out of your flasher, it still runs the same regardless. All right. Well, look for the Wedding Ring Salmon Tech Lure and the Max Paddle Flasher, the Scent Flash 360 flasher at a sporting goods store near you. Head down to Bernita and catch some of those big kings. Game changing. That's the best way to describe the new Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher from Max Lure Company. This 360 degree rotational inline flasher features a scent release system attracting salmon to the lure behind it like no other flasher on the market. Soak the free scent pad with any type of oil or gel, or load up the cavity with any type of bait for fishing success beyond your wildest dreams. It's the Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher, only from Max Lure Company. Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter with the gear you need for fishing, hunting, camping, paddling, cooking, and just about anything else you can do in the woods or in the water. With over 125 stores across America, there is bound to be a Sportsman's Warehouse near you with not only the gear you need, but also the experts to help you get the most out of the product you purchase. Head down to your local Sportsman's Warehouse today or shop online anytime at sportsmans.com. That's sportsmans.com. 
Enjoy a meal of wild Alaskan seafood delivered right to your door. Sina Sea offers premium quality wild Alaskan fish and shellfish to include Copper River King and Silver Salmon, Halibut, Black Cod, King Crab, and of course, Copper River Sockeye Salmon. Order it blast frozen or smoked and experience a slice of Alaska for a special meal you won't forget. Buy your seafood now at SinaSea.com. That's S-E-N-A-S-E-A, SinaSea.com. You're back in with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. As I used to say on Monty Python, now for something completely different. We've got Meg Carney on the line. She is the author of a new book called Outdoor Minimalist. It's all about wasteless hiking, backpacking, and camping. Meg is also a writer for Field and Stream and a professional writer by trade. Meg, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. You have to educate both me and my listeners here. I am aware of the leave no trace ethic when it comes to recreating outdoors. I am aware of the pack it in, pack it out ethic when it comes to recreating outdoors. But the concept of being an outdoor minimalist is new to me. Why don't you go ahead and explain this to our listeners? Sure. So those things, I would say, are directly related. And we can kind of think of outdoor minimalism as an expansion of those ideas, but to all areas of our outdoor recreation lives, because a lot of our impact starts before we ever go outside and even leave our house to hit the trail. And so that was kind of like the inspiration for the idea. And I do have a definition within the book, so I can read it really quick just to have like a succinct definition. Please. There's two parts. So the first part is an individual striving to minimize their impact in their relationships with nature. And the second part is one who consumes thoughtfully and only what they need and leaves the wilderness better than they found it. So you can kind of tell just from those definitions that it's really building on those concepts that already exist. All right. Now, you live in Washington State. I presume that you recreate in places like the Cascade Mountains. And when it comes to wasteless hiking and backpacking, what are some of the practices that you do that you recommend others do as well? Well, that's a pretty broad question. That's a lot of different things. So obviously always follow the no trace principles, but a big part of the Outdoor Minimalist book, like I mentioned before, is it starts before you get on the trail. So it's a lot about thoughtful consumption and prolonging the life of our outdoor equipment. So I think a big focus of mine to waste less while I am hiking is to make sure that I'm not only preserving those landscapes that I recreate in, but I'm helping preserve landscapes where the gear that I'm using to get outside is being manufactured. And let's talk a little bit about that. You are into repurposing and repairing gear for the long haul, as opposed to you know what seems to be the trend in America these days, and maybe the world as well, is just use it, abuse it, and then get something new like every year. Why is this important for our environment? Well, everything that we produce comes from a resource, and all the resources that we're using are primarily like petrol-based. They're finite, and we can't get them back. And so if we are continuously consuming more and more and more, then we're going to run out of things to make things from and also land to play in. So it's like a double-edged sword right there. And a big focus that I have always had is to start with what you have. And so it kind of just shifts the mindset away from always having to get something new to evaluating what you have available to yourself and how you can use that to do the things that you love. So let's talk about another aspect of being an outdoor minimalist, and that's food. Why don't you go ahead and explain this chapter about rethinking trail food? Yeah, so food in general, the entire food system, this extends beyond backpacking food, has a huge environmental impact, and it becomes more difficult when we are backpacking or in the backcountry because much of it is prepackaged. And so there's multiple layers to it. So the food itself has an impact. So if it's an animal product, if it's plants where it's being sourced and like the general processing, but then also the packaging that is used. And if it is compostable, recyclable, or if it's just going straight to the landfill. 
And so that chapter focuses a lot on how you can evaluate your food footprint, I guess, and then also how you can do something called a waste audit. And that is to analyze the amount of waste or trash that you're producing on one backpacking trip and finding ways to gradually eliminate and find better replacements that would have a lower impact. Okay. So let's take me as an example here. I'm going to hit the trail. I'm going to go on a backpacking trip. I've got my granola bars. I've got my trail mix. I've got my freeze-dried food that I'm going to have of reducing my imprint, if that's what I'm taking with me. So all of those things are coming in a package. So that is often the easiest place for people to start because it's something really tangible and they have a part of that afterlife. So they're disposing of it in some way. And so usually I would say like, look at what the packaging is on those products. And if there is like the exact same alternative, so granola bars, for example, they often have granola bars that you can make yourself at home that are very delicious and you can package them in reusable packages like the beeswax wraps so you don't have anything that you have to throw in the trash. Or you can buy from a company that maybe they're local to your area and they use at-home compostable packaging for the granola bars. Or another option would be if you like having the convenience of the pre-packaged meals and don't want to invest the time in making your own and dehydrating all that and packaging it, then there are options like Fernway Food Company, which is out of the Pacific Northwest, and they have at-home compostable packaging and excellent sourcing for all of their foods. So a lot of it is kind of research and willing to invest time into finding those alternatives. Let's talk about something else. You have a whole chapter about pets. One of the things we should talk about pets is pet waste. And you brought up something that is so true, how the first 200 yards on a trail from any trailhead, you see more dog poop and more dog poop bags. It's like, why do people put the poop in a bag and leave it there and then don't take it away? I've never understood that before. (laughs) I mean, I think those people are well-intentioned and then honestly, they forget that they did that. And then it just ends up sitting there because a lot of those people, they're not going there every single day. Maybe they went there one day a month or on the weekend. And so they bag the poop with the intention of bringing it to the receptacle and then they just walk past it on their way out. So that is one big reason. There's a lot of other reasons that people leave dog poop. I would say a big one is they're not aware of the dangers and they don't consider it a pollutant because dogs are animals. And I have had people tell me before, oh, you don't need to pick up your dog's poop because coyotes poop out here, turkeys poop out here. We don't pick up their poop. But the main difference (laughs) is that those animals are native to that ecosystem. They're not entering the ecosystem and defecating and exposing the animals to new parasites and new bacteria. And like you're saying, in a lot of areas, there's high concentrations of dog poop or urine in one area. And that can add a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, things like that to the soil, which then runs off into waterways. And that is where things like toxic algae blooms come from that Ah. suffocate the plant. They kill aquatic creatures, all types of things. Same thing with like manure runoff. It's the same concept. Very interesting. And pun intended here, folks, a lot to digest in this book, (laughs) Outdoor Minimalist by Meg Carney. It's available now. It's a brand new book, but it's available now. You can find it in local bookstores. You can find it through Amazon. And by the way, Meg is also a podcast host. You should really check out her podcast to find out more about becoming an outdoor minimalist the website to go to is the outdoor minimalist.com that's the outdoor minimalist.com meg thanks for opening our eyes today on northwestern outdoors radio thanks for having me
Located in the northeast corner of Oregon, Wallawa County offers a unique destination rich in natural beauty and outdoors recreation. Enjoy the clear waters of Wallawa Lake. Take a tram to the top of Mount Howard for million dollar views. Hike or ride into the Eagle Cap Wilderness and fish or raft the Wallawa and Grand Ronde Rivers. It's all waiting for you in beautiful Wallawa County. Plan your visit today at WallawaCountyChamber.com. That's WallawaCountyChamber.com. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is the voice for your public lands, waters, and wildlife. From the Canadian Yukon to the Florida Everglades, we're stepping up to conserve North America's public lands, defend our hunting and fishing traditions, and expand access to the outdoors. Find out how you can get involved at backcountryhunters.org. You're back in with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got Jason Brooks on the line, a prolific outdoors writer. You can read his articles in all sorts of publications, including Northwest Sportsman Magazine. Jason, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me back. We've got deer hunting to talk about. After all, it is opening up on the 10th in Idaho, on the 15th in Washington, and it's opening up this weekend in Oregon. And I wanted to talk about what hunters should do right before the opener, the things they need to do to help them be successful as we get towards the general modern firearm season opener. Go ahead and give me your thoughts on this subject. What's the first thing that jumps out to you? The first thing that jumps out to me is going to be going through my pack, going through my gear. I know a a lot of the hunters out there are thinking, well, what about the rifle? What about going to the range? What about getting in shape? You know, hotel reservations if you're going out of town or camping spots. But back up, the one thing that you really need to really concentrate on, at least for me, is what am I carrying out in the field? And, you know, I don't know about, about the listeners, but for me, I have a backpack that I use every year, and I keep certain items in it that I always have, starting with my survival kit. Because when you're out in the mountains, you have to be able to stay a night or two unprepared just in case the worst happens. When is the last time you went through that kit? Are the matches still working? Uh, does the lighter still work? I've, had, I've gone out in the mountains and, and tried to use my lighter, and it's actually in rusted. A little wheel flint there rusted on me. I couldn't use it. So... Really, you have to think big picture, but then you have to start looking at the small details. And that's what's going to help you become more successful out in the field so you don't forget those things. I usually keep a power bar or two or some sort of energy bar in my backpack as an emergency food source. And one year I opened it up and I realized it was like expired by like five years. You have an excellent point. I mean, I have certainly opened up my first aid kit before thinking, boy, I am sore. I need some Tylenol or some aspirin. And it's like, oh. This expired five years ago, so uh, excellent point there. But let's talk about range time, because that is critical, I think, for hunters before they hit the field. It is, and, you know, to be honest with you, one thing, range time doesn't start just at the range, okay? It could actually start at the cleaning bench. And what I mean by that is, is, is like in, in my garage, I've got a cleaning bench where I've got uh, basically a, a setup where I can put the rifle and rest it on there. So I have to worry about touching it, holding it, and, and then remove the bolt and then clean the, the rifle thoroughly. So hopefully you have a cleaning bench at home. If not, when you get to the range, first thing you need to do is put on the cleaning bench. Before you put any ammo down range, put on the cleaning bench and clean the firearm from beginning to end. I mean, from buttstock to the, the crown of the, the barrel. There's several reasons why you want to do this. First and foremost is when you're cleaning it, you're actually inspecting it. So you're looking at it to make sure there's no cracks in the stock. If it's a woodstock rifle, the bedding is still good to go. I mean, we're talking about deep cleaning. We're talking about take the actual firearm apart and deep clean it. And sometimes pine needles get down into the bedding, and next thing you know, your free-floating barrel is no longer free-floating, and you wonder why your shots are all over the place or they're shooting far left versus a far right. So you do that first. And also keep in mind, Hopefully at the end of the year or end of the end of the season last year, you, you cleaned it as well. But any of those oils that are on the firearm, if you've noticed in your house, you, you go to clean the bookshelf, there's dust, right? There's dust on your bookshelf. Well, dust goes through all of our house and that dust can actually get into the firearm. And when it touches the oils, it actually turns into like almost like a gum-like substance or a real adhesive. It's no longer the oil that keeps the action free and moving. It actually binds it up and gums it up. So you want to make sure everything is clean before you fire a shot down range because that way you're starting with the firearm at its peak performance. So that's the first thing you need to do is clean the firearm. And then once you finally decide to sight in the rifle or re-zero the rifle or check the zero of the rifle, that's when it's time to start going to that hunting mode. Does that, that make sense at all? It does. It makes perfect sense. 
As for getting in shape, that is very important for hunters, especially if you're doing the high buck hunt that is now concluded. But a little late for that, especially if you're in Oregon where the deer hunting season opens up this weekend. So shame on you if you didn't get in shape already. You don't have a whole lot of time to do so before the season starts in Idaho and Washington, but you might want to consider that. Let's talk about scouting, though, because... This is probably the best time to scout because if you find the deer now, there's a good chance they're going to be in the same place when the season opens. It is. If I really could just back up really quick on that conditioning part, and I talked about you know shooting the rifle and, and those kind of things, I'm kind of leading a little segue here. For what it's worth for the listeners, I don't want to skip over the conditioning part, but it's not the physical conditioning. Like you just mentioned, it might be a little late to, to uh, strap on the running shoes and go out for you know a five-mile jog. But it's never too late to get mentally prepared. And that, to me, is actually the most important part of all of hunting. And that starts at the range. What I meant by you get ready to get in a hunting mode is don't put your rifle in a rest, pull the trigger, and go, yay, I hit the bullseye. Now practice with it in different positions, different ways to shoot. And it's mentally telling you, yes, I can still get down and shoot in the prone position. No, I can't do that anymore. I need a rest. But now back to the physical aspect of it. You should have been out working out whether you did or not, you know, good for you, shame on you. But the mental part is knowing what your limitations are and being okay with that. So if you know, hey, I can get to the top of that mountain, but it's going to take me a little extra longer time, then you'll still get there. But if you're like, I can't do that, well, you've already given up. So for me, the, the mental preparation of hunting is the most important part. People will look at me and go, how'd you get up this mountain? And I always tell them, one foot in front of the other, how'd you get up here? You know, and, and it, it takes them back by surprise. So I really want to stress that now is the time to really get mentally prepared for the hunt. And to segue into the, the scouting portion you just mentioned, that's a great way to do it. If you can go out and grab the spotting scope and a pair of binoculars and hike up to your favorite basin or along your trail or even just drive the road you plan on driving to get to deer camp, and start looking for animals, it will get you in the mindset. So that way, when you do find a nice buck in that area, and you come back in two weeks or three weeks or, or even tomorrow, and you find that same buck again, you're not, like, surprised. You're like, oh, there he is, and I can do this because I've already hiked up this ridge once already this year. So that all leads into success as well as just enjoying the hunt. You know, people get so caught up in today's society of social media on how big was the buck you got or how big was the bull you got. No, I look at it as go, oh, man, that's fantastic. You've got a chance to go out and opportunity to even hunt, let alone get something then how big is it that's that's way down the road for me in my in my book jason you are always full of wisdom when it comes to hunting i've got to ask where are you going to be hunting this year so in washington uh, my home state i actually did the muzzleloader uh, both deer and elk tags my son did the archery elk and deer tags we actually have been in the back country for archery elk Talking about physical conditioning and mental conditioning, I got a little prelude to it a couple of weeks ago. We went up in the Cascade Crest. We went in six miles and uh, stayed the night in a, fun fact for you, in a rainstorm. And we're using a floorless hot tent now. The, the All the rays, these hot tents. Yeah. Um, just remember that to put drainage in because all that water hits that teepee tent and it comes running down the sides. If the inside of the tent is still lower than the outside, it's still going to run underneath. My Uh-oh. son woke up in an inch of, an inch of water. Uh-oh. So, But in Idaho, I've got several hunts planned in Idaho. I'm going into the Frank Church Wilderness in a couple of weeks for an Idaho elk and deer combination, mule deer and elk. But I also have, as one of the few that actually was able to get a second deer tag for Idaho, and I've got a, uh, a north end, I'll leave it that, one of the top north units. I won't say too much general deer tag, so it happens to be a time frame we can hunt mule deer and whitetails, but we're primarily focusing on whitetails. My son's got that same tag, so we'll be doing that together. And then he also drew an Idaho cow tag for the end of the year. So we've got several hunts planned over in Idaho. We can't wait to get over there. Love Idaho, love their hunting and their wildlife. And of course, we got wolf tags and all that good fun stuff. But yeah, I have yet to hit Oregon. I, I need to go down and uh, visit my buddy Troy Radikowski and, and try and do some Oregon hunting at some point. Well, I have no doubt Troy would love to take you along. What a great person to go hunting with. Another guest on our show that you hear from time to time, folks. Speaking of range time, I've got to ask, what kind of rifle are you going to be hunting with this season? Oh, I, you know, my friend Lee Freeman at Oregon Mountain Rifle Company was gracious enough to let me shoot his Lone Rock TI in 6.8 Western, and I fell in love with this rifle. 6.8 pounds, it's got a 24-inch barrel, it reaches way out there, it's a tack driver, 
it's an insane rifle. I tell you what, I, I can't wait to take this rifle to Idaho and the Frank Church and then go hunt some whitetails with it. It's a Lone Rock TI titanium action from Oregon Mountain Rifle Company. Phenomenal rifle. Love it. You know, the 6.8 Western, I know uh, very well-known hunting writer Ron Spomer is a big fan of this cartridge. What do you think of it? So far, I'm really liking it. You know, Jack O'Connor made the 270 famous, and so this shoots a 6.8 millimeter bullet, which is 277, the 270, and it's just, it's basically a 270 on steroids. It shoots flat, it hits hard, you can shoot a heavier bullet, so a, long, a little longer bullet, so better bullet and coefficient. I'm really excited about this rifle. I'm telling you, Omar did a phenomenal job putting this package together, and this round, this rifle is the ultimate Western hunting rifle. I can't wait. We've got to go, but Jason, thank you so much for sharing these great preseason deer hunting tips with our listeners on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter with the gear you need for fishing, hunting, camping, paddling, cooking, and just about anything else you can do in the woods or in the water. With over 125 stores across America, there is bound to be a Sportsman's Warehouse near you with not only the gear you need, but also the experts to help you get the most out of the product you purchase. Head down to your local Sportsman's Warehouse today or shop online anytime at sportsmans.com. That's sportsmans.com. Want to put a smile on your face? Start off by putting a smile blade from Max Lure Company on your line. Max smile blades come in different sizes and spin at slow speeds, not like those metal blades on other lures. Buy them separately or on ready-made rigs like the wedding ring spinner, double whammy, wallet pop, and more. Smile blades work for trout, bass, walleye, as well as other species, and when that fish hits, you'll have a grin on your face that won't go away. The Smile Blade, only from Max Lure Company. Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter, full of the gear you need to succeed this hunting season. Firearms, ammo, archery equipment, decoys, clothing, boots, and more. You'll find it all at Sportsman's Warehouse. Better still, the knowledgeable staff can help you with tips to help you bag a trophy or a limit. Find a location near you or shop online today at sportsmans.com. We've got time for one more shot of Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. I'm glad you're back. Did you know that Sportsman's Warehouse is having a Savage Rifle sale? That's right. Savage Rifles, they've been around a long time, and you can actually get $50 off Savage Rifles to include the Minimalist Bolt Action 22 caliber rifle. It comes in either teal and gray or purple and pink, and it sells for only $229 right now. In addition to this, you can get a 6.5 Creedmoor Bolt Action Combo Rifle that comes with a Bushnell Scope for the incredible price of just $329. You are not going to beat that price before deer season starts. So head on down to your local Sportsman's Warehouse store today and take advantage of the Savage Rifle Sale. And now it is time for your Sportsman's Warehouse Trivia Question of the Week. And it's about the elk. It's a revered animal by many called the Wapiti by the Shawnee tribe. And it's actually the official state animal of one state that just happens to have a very good football team playing in the Pac-12. Do you know which state has made the elk its official mammal? If you do, you know what to do. Go to our Facebook page at Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Look for the post thread and give us your answer there or... Just go to our website at northwesternoutdoors.com, shoot us an email through the website, and let us know what state has the elk as its official state mammal. One lucky person who guesses right will win that $25 gift card we give away every week from America's Premier Outfitter. And on that note, it is time to go, but... I have just gotten back from a great trip to western Montana. We'll be sharing all of the details with you next week on the show to include some fishing on the Clark Fork River and a visit to the Bison Range and a chat with Mark Holyoke with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Can't wait to share all of that with you. 
I'd like to thank our great guests today, Chris Hurst, Meg Carney, and Jason Brooks, as well as Bob Loomis and David Sparks for giving us some great information. I also hope you're going to get out there and enjoy everything that October has to offer, whether you fish or hunt or hike or paddle, make it a point to enjoy this wonderful month in the field or on the water. Until next time, do take care, God bless, and make it a point to spend some time outdoors. 